All right. Welcome, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. We have a good, good showing of a lot of people on the call today, and I'm always glad to see uh, a lot of people interested in, in Nicaragua, and uh, really appreciate you joining the call. Um, a little bit of technical issue, and I'll get going. All right, here we go. Uh, my name is Patrick Hebert. I am the Chief Operating Officer for ECI Development. And uh, I'm a Canadian citizen and a resident of Nicaragua. Um, my joint um, presenter is Diego Glover, who uh, will be speaking with me on some of the slides here today. ECI development is a uh, a company that provides re resort and residences of, across Central and, and South America in, in numerous countries. And we have quite a broad width of, of the type of offerings that we have. Um, working on a project in Belize, well, several projects in Belize and Marriott residences. Uh, we just, we have uh, just recently announced a branding of our Grand Bayman Gardens as a Best Western. Uh, we have a very interesting over the water project of tiny homes. Um, and in, in Nicaragua, we have the, the Teak, and we also have a, the large uh, Grand Pacifica Golf and Beach Resort, which we're going to be talking about quite a bit today, later on in the, in the presentation. We also have property in, in Costa Rica and joint venture with another company in, in Panama, and a number of future acquisitions as well as one we recently just did in Panama. Today we're going to be focusing on Nicaragua. So we're going to talk about a few different things. Why Nicaragua? Living in Nicaragua, the benefits of investing in Nicaragua. And then we'll let's focus a little bit of time on, on our property. Um, you know, full disclosure, a little bit of sales pitch at the end there on our Grand Pacifica Beach and Golf Resort. And then we'll be happy to answer questions. So have you ever been to Nicaragua? We, we like to joke, there's really only two answers to that question. It's either to that question, it's either yes or, or not yet. It's a beautiful country and uh, we'll talk about a little bit about it going forward here. So why Nicaragua? Nicaragua, despite, you know, a lot of people of my generation remember Nicaragua in the news from the late 70s um, with the revolution and, uh, you know, the, the history there, you know, the, for some, you know, for that reason, you know, that's already 40 years old, but despite that, you know, the Nicaraguan name for some of us would watch news as, you know, when we were younger, that the, the, the concept of Nicaragua always had that, well, is it, is it safe? You'll be surprised to know the statistics show that it's one of the safest countries, if not the safest country in the, in the Americas, certainly in Central America. And, you know, it all, one of the reasons that it has some of the most inexpensive real estate is because it is perceived as, as not safe, despite being very safe. Well, one of the things on the, safe, on the safety side, and we'll talk a little bit more of that later too, but it's, it's the unique way that Nicaragua went about um, creating kind of a neighbor, you know, the equivalent of an, a North American neighborhood watch and also, and, um, you know, creating work for, for people and made a, a really large police force back, back in the eighties. And so they never developed, um, a lot of the, you know, the, the drug problem that, you know, has been an issue for some of the Central American countries. They didn't have gangs. <clears throat> and so it, it's made it a very, very safe country for that reason. And like I said, we'll go into a little bit of the statistics on that in a minute. It has an extremely low cost of living. Obviously, there's many, many natural and historical treasures. It has the, the oldest city, Granada, of, in all of the Americas, built on the Lake Nicaragua. You know, used to be a city there for basically protecting against the, the pirates of the Caribbean. So it it's really has a rich history in the country. Um, I mentioned I was Canadian citizen and a, a Nicaraguan resident. And the reason I'm a Nicaraguan resident 
uh, you know, on top of these other reasons, it's definitely, uh, as a Canadian, you're looking for a, a better climate. And so there's no doubt that was uh, influential in my decision to become a resident of Nicaragua. You know, the, most of Central America and Northern South America has, has great climates, but Nicaragua is kind of situated right in the middle um, where our Grand Pacifica property is, it's in a, in a valley, you know, somewhat sheltered by a, a volcanic mountain range. And so you, you get a really ideal kind of climate there. It's also, you know, close to North America. And we'll go through a few of the slides on exactly where it is. It's, it's amazing how many times that people say, Nicaragua, that, that's in Africa, isn't it? Well, no, it's just the, north, the country just north of Costa Rica. You know, Costa Rica did a great job starting probably in the 80s of, of marketing itself. And, and Nicaragua, frankly, just didn't. And, and so, you know, you tend to know much less about a country like Nicaragua than you do about Costa Rica. But, you know, they're very, very similar in terms of landscape, um, you know, beautiful jungles, volcanoes, spectacular beaches. Um, but Nicaragua is anywhere from one quarter to probably one fifth of the cost of living and cost of real estate of uh, equivalent property in, in Costa Rica. So it's why it's become you know, quite popular in recent years. It's got a growing tourism industry. We'll talk a little bit about over, you know, had a bit of a stumble in the last couple of years and we'll talk a little bit about that, but uh, continues to kind of grow again now. It has a great foreign landowner rights. This was another reason why I chose to, to buy in, in Nicaragua originally. Um, when I, I, I looked at you know, countries like Mexico, I'd spent quite a bit of time in Puerto Vallarta and other cities like that. Um, but if you wanna own beachfront property specifically, you had to go through a, you know, a trust and, and various things. Well, Nicaragua treats um, foreigners with the exact same, um, exactly the same uh, landowner rights as, as it does for, for local Nicaraguans, which is, is really nice. It has three different, um, pretty, pretty very substantial and, and easy to obtain resident programs. So people for looking for, a, you know, what we like to talk about in, in the industry here is a, a plan B, whether you're a, a citizen from the US or Canada or a European country or somewhere else in the world, it's nice to have a, a, residence, a residency in a, in a country that's welcoming to you as super friendly people. And, uh, you know, it just, if you, if you ever decide, even if now's not the right time, and, and for many of it, you, it probably is now is the right time, but if it's not, it's still nice to know that you, you have a, a plan B. So where is Nicaragua? If you look at the colorful map there in the dark black, it's an arrow Nicaragua pointing to you know, the center of the map. Nicaragua is the largest of the Central American countries. And um, you'll, you'll see just above, it's just above Costa Rica, which is just above Panama. So it, it's very, <coughs> excuse me, very close um, flights from Houston, Miami, and so on, you know, various places, Atlanta, and, and other flights coming on all, all the time. But it, it's, you know, it's, it's a very close two, two and a half hour flight from, from the US. Nicaragua, I, I mentioned earlier that ECI development, um, we have property in, in numerous countries and we use this, this graph and this scale kind of quite a bit in describing um, for people who are interested in, in checking out different countries. For instance, at the, at the, well, the, the way the scale when the graph works is the more mature markets, so to speak, are at the top of the, of the scale and the, and the less mature from, a, from an economy or a tourism standpoint or development standpoint is at the, as the bottom. Now, if you look at the Pacific coast of Costa Rica, you'll see that, uh, you know, that's right at the top. Panama is very close to the top. Those countries have done a really good job of promoting themselves for decades. And so they're a more mature market. And so if you're looking, for instance, at the ROI on a, on a rental property, you, it'll cost you quite a bit more to buy in to those, to those areas, but they will likely produce a higher cash flow um, because, of, because of the maturity of the market. 
And you can go down the scale and see that, you know, Costa Rica highlands or Costa Rica on the Caribbean side is not as developed. Belize is kind of middle ground. I personally would put Nicaragua a little bit higher on this scale. I think it's, you know, come a long ways in the last decade. I've been, well, I, I officially live in, in Nicaragua right now, but I, I was, I've been going there for um, 15 years. So around 2005, 2004, somewhere in that area was the first time I came down to Nicaragua. And I've seen a lot of changes, obviously, in infrastructure and everything like that. But also, and I, I would say it's moved up the curve a little bit here. Um, you know, it does actually produce pretty good cash flow from rental properties. And, and you know, it's a, there's a lot of interest. It's kind of the, you know, in a lot of ways, it's kind of the vogue spot where people are looking and it's like, wow, you know, I want to find something new. It's got the beauty of, of Costa Rica or Panama, but not as expensive and not as well known. And so it, I would say it's, it's quickly moving up this graph, if, if not already further up. We talk about it being the safest country in Central America. Now there's all sorts of statistics and every country kind of wants to claim this, or at least, you know, Costa Rica, Panama, and Nicaragua all try to claim this, but, um, you know, it, it is one of the safer countries in the, in, the, in the region for sure. There's a number of different reports that have done studies on that. Um, if you look at the, the graphs here, you'll see that um, these are the statistics on, uh, like for instance, you know, nobody likes to look at the homicide statistics, but you see the Nicaraguan green is, is you know, slightly less than Panama and Costa Rica, um, quite a bit less than Honduras and El Salvador. But surprisingly, you know, also less than by a long shot than, than Cleveland, Ohio, and San, St. Louis, Missouri, which we just put on here kind of for, you know, for, for relativity's sake. But what, what that does is it, it makes an interesting opportunity because, you know, Nicaraguan real estate prices are low uh, for a number of reasons, but a lot of it is because of a false belief of a lack of safety. And so that, you know, that become, you know, that also produces an opportunity for people. On the right side, the graph is um, considered a crime and theft is a major problem for doing business in America. Um, these are um, a World Economic Forum's perceived numbers. So if you look halfway down the graph there, you'll see the United States is a 3.5. These aren't the percentages of, a, of a, you know, crime. This is how, when people have a business in these countries, how they feel about is crime or theft an issue for you doing business in the country. And you'll see at the bottom, second from the bottom is Canada, obviously considered a very safe country. And, and then Nicaragua from, from this perspective is considered even safer than Canada. And we talk about affordable real estate. Well, we, we picked one um, property that's very similar to a property that we have at, at Grand Pacifica, for instance. It's a one bedroom, one bath. Uh, 802 square feet in this case is almost a million dollars in San Diego and I wouldn't consider San Diego you know even as expensive as the Bay Area for instance in, in California but obviously high on the high on the price list so if you want to be looking out at the Pacific Ocean from your living room you're, you know that's the kind of dollars you're going to be paying at the same time you know on the right hand side you'll see we have a, a property uh, a condo right on the beachfront as well very similar a little bigger, 960 square feet, one bedroom, one bath, and being offered currently at $159,000. So, you know, that there's a, a radical difference in the in the prices. You're on the looking out at the same ocean. It's a little bit warmer in Nicaragua in the in the ocean, while well, in on the land as well. But uh, you know, it's a it's a comfortable climate with a very comfortable beach and and water to to swim and surf, boating in. You know, for me, I, I like being near the ocean and, and near mountains. I lived in Vancouver Island in Canada for, for most of my life. And so when I was looking at property, I wanted to have you know the mountains and ocean nearby and, and Nicaragua has the volcano. So you have the volcanic, volcanic range of mountains and you also have, have the ocean. Now, you know, I wouldn't go swimming very often in the ocean off of Vancouver Island because the water's just simply too cold. But in, in Nicaragua, we, we go into the water all the time. It's a very, you know, very low cost of living in Nicaragua, certainly relative to, to almost any of the other countries that we've talked about. On the bottom there, it says the purchasing power is three to four times 
that of the U.S. I, I think it's actually considerably higher. Um, I know my wife and I, you know, I, I'm actually in Belize right now in Ambergris Key in the Caribbean because I, I didn't quite get the last flight out of Belize um, when the COVID issue started. So this is where I've been quarantining. But I'd, I'd really like, you know, to get home soon to, to Nicaragua because that, that building that you saw in the last last picture was is actually, you know, my permanent address is in that in that building. But my wife and I just before we came down here went shopping and and you know we we go shopping in in uh, the markets like you'll see on the on the right hand side you you can go shopping in the typical supermarket they have La Union or Colonia these are these are kind of the the larger shopping centers they have a there's a Walmart in Managua about 45 minutes away from from our property but we we prefer to kind of go to the markets where everything's fresh and 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 better and, and frankly a lot less expensive but we filled up maybe you know the, those those big burlap sacks that are i don't know you know they come up to your hip when you lift them up and uh, we filled that up with all sorts of fruits and vegetables and, and went to to pay for it and the total came out to just under three dollars uh, there's not too many places on earth where you can you know buy weeks worth of of vegetables and fruit for for that kind of price. So. There's uh, many natural and historic treasures, like I mentioned earlier. Um, the city of Granada, for example, is the oldest country in in all of the Americas, and uh, you know also in Leon has the uh, another beautiful city in Nicaragua has the oldest cathedral, um, and just a lot of things. And all the cities and and heritage sites are are beautiful. Um, just that that old Spanish colonial feeling, and uh, it's it's they're they're just you know really beautiful cities that are all pretty close by, and uh, you know even Managua is getting cleaned up a lot. I, I I don't you know promote Managua as a as a destination, but that's where the international airport is. But but Granada is only about you know 30, 40 minutes out of there. Leon about an hour, an hour and a half, and you know we chose to live at Grand Pacifica, which is kind of central to these different destinations. Uh, the Messiah Volcano is, is very close by there too. And as I mentioned, it's an amazing year-round climate. Um, there's a, there's a, a dry season in, the, in what we call the green. I mean, I, I, I mentioned earlier, I, I come from Vancouver Island. So for Americans, that's just above Seattle. So it has the same climate as Seattle. So when I, when I think of a rainy season, for instance, I'm thinking of you know three weeks of solid gray skies and drizzle and and cool weather, you know not terribly inviting and you see the sun once every couple weeks at best and 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 that's pretty much November to to May and Nicaragua's climate when we talk about the rainy season it's the tropical rainy season where you get 15 minutes of of rain usually at night and it. You know the amount of rain that falls is probably the same amount of rain as Vancouver has for in or Seattle has in three weeks, and it happens in 15 minutes. But you know, torrential downpours, but then the, the you know sky clears up again, and you have beautiful days. It's cooler. The the you know the air is fresh, and it, it's just you know a really nice climate. Now from mid December, if you ask the locals, it's from mid December till exactly. May 15th is when the May, May, May 15th is when the the rainy season starts again, and, and it, it is almost that accurate. You can almost set your watch by it. But it, you know, the, between December and May, it really almost never rains. So we, you know, we we have a kind of a little running joke for people that stay in January, or February, in the, in the property when they're renting and they will have gone to Hawaii the year before or something and say, well, it rained the whole time that I was there and it's kind of disappointing. And we'll, we'll literally say, if it rains, if you're there in February, for instance, and it rains, we'll give you your money back because it just doesn't. So. Again, on the proximity to, to North America, you'll see that um, Nicaragua is kind of directly in the center of, of Central America, you know, between South America and, and Mexico. And again, close to close to Miami, close to Houston, close to a lot of the, you know, obviously because of its location, especially between 
uh, Miami and, and Panama City, which Panama City is kind of a hub for Central America. You, you do get a lot of, of flights kind of stopping over in Managua. So you have a, a lot of options for, for flights, which is, which is really handy. There's a little zoom, zoomed in version of it. Again, you can basically see that, you know, there's, there's flights being added all the time and uh, it, it makes it, it's pretty convenient to, to get back and forth. The tourism industry, as I put on here, is growing again. Um, up until 2018, it was growing very rapidly, and we'll talk a little bit about you know what happened in 2018. But uh, a, big, a big part of the tourism is actually from Central America, other Central American countries. Costa Ricans love to go to Nicaragua because it, I guess maybe it feels like home, but it's a lot less expensive. Um, you get a lot of Panamanians get, um, you know, a growing South American group too, and European. Lots of uh, Scandinavians love to go to Nicaragua. And uh, obviously a big chunk of it, almost 30% is North America. And of that 30%, another 25% of that is Canadian and about 75% of that US. Now, they, you know, they all fit in the room is, you know, what happened in Nicaragua, I mentioned, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, there, there was a social political issue, and well, I, you know, I'm just going to talk about it a little bit. I'm, I'm not um, a political science expert. Um, I'm certainly not a political, politically oriented person, and and I, I am a resident of Nicaragua, but I consider myself still a guest of the country. I'm a Canadian citizen, but chose to to move out of Canada and, and live permanently in Nicaragua. But um, just a little bit of background on, on the issues that happened in 2018, which did, did affect the tourism. Um, much like many countries, Nicaragua, you know, is dealing with an, an aging population, baby boomers growing up. Um, that's putting a lot of stress on the, on the pension plan, social services. And Nicaragua does get some funding from the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. And the IMF required Nicaragua to take a look at their pension plan and revamp it couple of years ago. Well, the government, you know, decided to announce changes to its social services. Um, probably could have thought it through a little bit more the way they announced it, but it is what it is. And, and it ended up causing quite a few protests. Now, obviously, if you're living in the US right now, you, you know how protests can sometimes go. And, uh, and there was clashes between protesters and, and police, and there was con con confrontations. And things did, you know, go downhill, and and ultimately, you know, it, it was not a very good scene, and the, you know, the there were some people that died from from the confrontations, and it's a, it was a very serious thing. Now, ultimately, the government repealed a uh, number of the changes, and and things settled down within weeks or a couple months. And um, the the problem is that during that time, you know, it really impacted tourism. There was you know, international news about it. Um, you know, so tourism was was heavily impacted, and then because of tourism being heavily impacted, um, over the past decade, tourism had surpassed agriculture and other areas as you know uh, for the GDP and on the economic side of things. So it, it had a serious impact for sure on the on the economy. Now today, if you're going, I mean, I was there during this whole time. My wife and I were there, and we you know, drive into the city and just avoid the protests and those sorts of things. But, but you know, it, it's, you know, not to be, you know, underplaying it, it was a serious issue for sure. But today, if you're driving around, you, you know, anywhere in the country, you wouldn't know uh, that any of this occurred. Um, but tourism is, is slow to recover to, you know, these kind of situations and, and likewise the, the economy. Um, you know, the one, I guess the one outlier to that is surfers in general don't, don't mind um, emptier beaches. So from, from that standpoint, we haven't really seen a, you know, a lower number of surfers coming to the country. In fact, maybe, maybe a few more, but the typical um, family tourists, you know, definitely took a hit in the spring of 2018. Um, but despite, despite that between, you know, it's worth mentioning that between surfers and, and Central American tourists, and the Central American tourists really started coming a lot, and and you know the the uh, other Nicaraguans you know started having more beach vacations and, and that sort of thing. And 
And we actually had um, in, in 2019, this last year, we had you know the best rentals um, ROI that we've had at, at, at our properties in Grand Pacifica. So, you know, uh, so we were you know pleasantly surprised by that. And, and I, I think it bodes well for the tourism starting to come back strongly. You know, obviously the second point there is is a worldwide issue. You know, pandemic is is creating a you know a, a huge issue for for everywhere in the world, but it was particularly a bit of a one-two punch for for Nicaraguans uh, and and their economy. So it's you know this has been very tough for the the local people. You know, Grand Pacifica, our property there, is the one of the two largest employers in the area. Us and uh, Florida Canyon, that's the, the rum company. They have uh, tons of sugarcane fields around our area. So if you've ever, if you like rum and you've never tried Florida Canyon, I highly recommend it. It's delicious, but the, uh, they're, they're a big employer in the country and, and, and we are certainly in this, in this region. So, you know, we've, it, it's been, we've, we've seen it firsthand and uh, these issues and, you know, certainly recently with COVID, the, the impact on employment for the locals is 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 tough, but I guess you know with every downside there is a there is an upside. So not to certainly look at it like something to take advantage of, but it, it does present buying opportunities for people. And and I, you know I'm not going to you know be embarrassed to say that because it also you know people people buying in these you know in the, in the country are gonna produce, ultimately help, you know, produce more jobs and, and, you know, the economy grows again because of that. So, you know, whether you're hiring somebody to work on your car or, you know, somebody to help you with the gardening or whatever it is, you know, producing more, you know, jobs is, is exactly what the country needs. So in living in Nicaragua, I'm just gonna see if we have, uh, it looks like our my friend Diego didn't make it onto the onto the panel, so I guess I you, you, unfortunately you're gonna have to keep listening to me. Diego's far more entertaining than I am, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going till till Diego shows up on the on the panelist list here. There's lots of things to do in Nicaragua, and you know these are just next couple slides are just a, a little bit of an idea to to give you some thoughts about what what is going on obviously fishing is fishing is a huge sport in in costa rica um less so in nicaragua but it's becoming more and more popular because uh people are claiming that some of the other more popular spots like like the shores of, of costa rica are getting fished out whereas the you know in in nicaragua you know, there's not just so little fishing going on that the, you know it's, it's pretty amazing i i caught a um, a, a 65 pound rooster fish well between my son and I because it played us both out and you know it was pretty amazing just right off the shores of, of the beach. Um, surfing is huge you know there's some some world-class surf breaks in in uh, in the country and uh, we we are lucky enough to have two of them right in front of Grand Pacifica so you know we certainly have a very active surfing community in the in the area. Snorkeling is, is, you know, more of a, a Caribbean side. Nicaragua is bordered by both oceans. And, uh, you know, the snorkeling is, is big on, in the Corn Islands, which is a beautiful set of Caribbean islands uh, that I, I highly recommend anybody that comes down to Nicaragua to try to, try to get over there. It's, it's spectacular as well. It's nice to have, it's nice to live in a country where, you know, you can quickly get across from one, one ocean to the other and experience the two types of environments. Diving again is, is more of a, a Corn Islands or a Caribbean. Blue Fields is another city on the Caribbean side. And, but you know, people do um, diving on the Pacific side as well and, and actually in the volcanic lagoons. So it's, it's, there's some pretty cool places to, to go diving. You know, obviously there's things, there's lots of places to go hiking, nature walks, dirt biking, um, you know, bicycling, uh, there's whitewater rafting very close to, to where I live. <clears throat> Although I don't tend to do that too often, but some people love it, so. 
You know, and I mentioned earlier that, that Nicaragua was, you know, up until the, the issues in 2018, Nicaragua was really on a steep curve of, of tourism um, and, and popularity and growing very quickly. Um, you know, in some of the countries, I, I remember it was, uh, you know, so some of the countries in, in Central America had about roughly, I think around 400,000 tourists a year. And I won't name the other countries because I don't want to put any of the Central American countries down at all. They're all they're all beautiful, but you know that was around 2005 when I first started going to Nicaragua. And then, as I mentioned, I think 2017 had over two million visitors to the country, tourists. So, while this other country, you know, had only you know stayed at around 400,000. So, Nicaragua's secret is definitely getting out. People are discovering that it's a very you know, economical place to, to to buy property, retire, have a second home, a vacation home, or a plan B, like I mentioned earlier. And it's 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 beautiful and, and the cost of living is very low. I already mentioned Granada. That's you know one of the main cathedrals in Granada. You see the lake in the background. <clears throat> That's the largest lake in Central America. Um, I think Lake Titicaca is the next biggest one that's in South America. So it's a it's a beautiful city. One of my favorite things to do in 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 the country is actually just going to Granada for you know an evening, and they they have what's called the Calzada. It's lots of restaurants and bars on uh, one major street, all the way down to the lake from the cathedral, and you know you have your choice of some of the great steak. They have uh, Nicaragua is famous for its churrasco, which is a is a thinly cut tenderloin steak, and um, <clears throat> you know, obviously, the lots of lobster and various types of fish and very all, all sorts of seafood. So you can eat your fill on the calzada and have you know some great wines and things. So it's a really it's a really nice place to to go. There's there's a you know a lot of different cities. Um, Messiah has a volcano. It's also the, uh, if you see the Messiah to the central left of this slide, that's an old fortress that was actually built in the town of Messiah, which is very near Granada. And that was the fortress to protect against, um, like I mentioned earlier, the Pirates of the Caribbean. So if you watch those movies, you can actually imagine, you know, this, is, this was reality for these people and, at that time. And, and the, the pirates would come up the San Juan River that, you know, that goes out to the Caribbean from the the large Nicaraguan lake, and then come up to the shores to to pillage these cities. So they had these fortresses built, and you can actually do a, a great little uh, boating tour um, right outside of Granada, which goes to Monkey Island, which is pretty cool. You get to hang out with monkeys; they'll they'll literally jump right on the boat and you know and usually steal whatever's in your pocket. And then you know the there's also you can go to the uh, some of the other islands which have old um, cannons on them which were you know to protect against the pirates so it's got a really rich history and, and this messiah fortress that you see there in the picture is is now converted into a market probably one of the more popular artisan markets in the in the country and uh, re a really cool place to to hang out for for a day too another one of my favorite places to go is the is the laguna de apoyo apoyo means support in, in Spanish, and it was it basically this freshwater lagoon supported a lot of people around it back centuries ago. And now there's a there's a great little restaurant on the shores called Abuelas, that means you know, grandmas. And it's you can you can run off of the the deck that you're eating on and jump right into the into the lagoon and go swimming. And it's just a it's a very interesting place and pretty cool for especially if you have a family. I used to take my kids there. My kids are all now in their mid twenties and older now, but you know they've been coming down to Nicaragua since they were young. And they used to love to go here too, because while I was eating, they get to run and jump into the into the lake, into the lagoon. And from you know going back to the safety standpoint, I mean I used to when my daughters went and got their their driver's license, so they would they would drive into the various cities um, all on their own without any issues. And I remember, you know, one of the first times I had a had a flat tire driving, came around a corner into a, into a village and had a flat tire on my truck. And, uh, you know, I'm 
being North American, I thought, oh no, what, what's what now? Because I, I saw a lot of people. It seemed like oh, half of the village was coming out of the out of the woodwork. And you know, before I could even say anything, they were jacking up the truck and changed my tire and you know, just kind of high fives and we went on our way. I thanked them and that was it. I just didn't even have to ask anybody. They just came out and helped me change the tire and. I right. said, so, well, this is some of the friendliest people. I, and I'm Canadian. I, I think we're considered friendly most of the time. But you know, these, these people are very amazing people and, and very giving. Well, you know, one of the popular things in, in Nicaragua that I think everybody tries once, which is the volcano boarding. It's basically a, a large volcano that you get a, you know, a, a elaborate piece of plywood it is a nice way to put it. And a, and a plastic suit and you walk all the way up to the top of this very black dusty hot mountain and at the top you just get on that board and and ride it down and it's pretty amazing to do once i would recommend it only once because it, it's <laughs> not not to take anything away from the guys that do these tours but i don't think they get too many people to come in twice but it's you can certainly knock it off your bucket list anyway the, the Masaya volcano is probably one of the coolest things on the planet, to be honest. I mean, it's one of the only volcanoes I know of in the world where you can, you know, go right up to the edge of it and uh, look down into, into the boiling lava. And, uh, they, you know, it's funny because you, you well, there's, there's a picture of me doing that. So <laughs> you can, it's, it's funny because you, you can park your car right at the edge. You don't even have to walk, you know, you literally walk. 20 feet because that's how close you're parking to the edge of the of the cauldron and um it's funny though they, they they ask you to to back your car into the parking spot so you can have a quicker getaway if it decides to erupt somehow i think if it erupts it's probably not going to matter which direction your car is facing but nonetheless it's nice that they're concerned about you the benefits of uh investing in in nicaragua One of the things I mentioned earlier is of uh, the reasons that I was really interested in, in owning land. And, and I, I have to admit, I was a little bit of a, like a, a kid in a candy store when I came down to Nicaragua in terms of, of property, because relative to, to uh, North American land, you know, if you look at the, the photo there, that's Grand Pacifica. And these properties are, are you know, that close to the beach, some of them right on the beach. And, uh, you know, just the, the cost is, is so much lower than the equivalent thing would be in in, in North America. But as I mentioned, um, you know, be, you know, the property taxes are also very low because it's it's one percent of the of the purchase price of the property, and the purchase price is usually pretty low. So, one you know, percent is is not much. And one of the things in Canada we have is a certainly in the in the prairies where I originally grew up, um, you know, the, the property tax rate is very high. You have a lot of roads going a lot of distances, and you know, the, in, in Nicaragua, you know, everything's a lot more compact, and you know, infrastructure costs are are lower. So generally, your property taxes are just that much lower as well. And 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 the more the most important point here is the equal treatment for foreign or domestic investors, and that you have you know a freehold title, just like a typical title you'd have on on land in in North America. You don't have to you know, set up a trust or whatever to own it with, with a, a local, you know, representative on there and, you know, which some countries do have. We'd already talked about this slide, but again, just to, you know, in terms of investing, you know, the, the opportunity to kind of catch the curve from, you know, as it starts to, to head up quickly is, is certainly in the, in the less you know, when you put all the pieces of the formula together, you take the, you know, the, the least, you know, mature market, you know, when it comes to capital gains, you know, the least mature market with, you know, the safety that the country has and, and all the other things that we've been talking about. And, and you know, it's just really makes Nicaragua well positioned for rising up that, that curve quickly. For those that are interested in residency, there's actually three kinds of rent residences. Residencies. Um, there's two mentioned here. One of them is also a rental one, um, less used, a little bit harder to get. 
But uh, the, the two most common ones are the pensioner program, pensionado. Um, by their standards in Nicaragua, as long as you're over 45, you're, you're welcome to be a pensioner. Um, you, you need to show a source of, of, of income, whether that's through your own business or some you know, pension or something of $600 a month. And uh, it's uh, for a spouse you, or um, sorry, dependents, it's an, uh, I think $150 per dependent in addition to that. So it's, it's you know, a pretty easy program to get into. Um, the, other, the other one and, and the one that I chose to go through was uh, the investor residency. You need to invest a minimum of, of 30,000 US dollars in Nicaragua, whether that's into property or a business or, or anything like that. You can do that at any age, of course. Um, and what you get is a five-year um, residency, that, which is renewable. And after that five years, you can you can choose to become a citizen if you of Nicaragua if you chose to. Um, obviously, you, as an investor, you can also run your own business. So that's the one that I chose to go with. So we'll talk a little bit about discovering Grand Pacifica. Well, one more thing I was going to mention on the residency too, for those people that are interested in that, uh, you can bring um, twenty thousand dollars worth of of um, belongings down from, for instance, if you're coming from the states or Canada, and um, you know the people have done that, and I, I personally wouldn't recommend it. I mean, I would obviously keep your your keepsakes and everything that's important to you if you're if you're permanently moving down to to Nicaragua, but. You know, there's beautiful, beautiful furniture, and and you can get all the typical modern appliances, like you know, and everything you you want. They're not that, you know, the, the cost is maybe these days maybe 10 10 percent more than it is in the U.S. You can get all the you know flat screen TVs and that sort of thing. Like I said, there's there's WalMarts and all sorts of different stores um, that you can you can purchase that sort of stuff at. But one of my favorite things is to go to a town called Masatepe, and that's one of the cool things about Nicaragua is each each little village or town seems to have its kind of artisan thing that it does. You know, some are pottery towns, some are woodworking towns, some are you know whatever they're you know artwork, nurseries for for plants. Um, Masatepe is one that where it's basically a furniture building or woodworking town, and it's it's pretty impressive. I I remember when I first went down there and was looking at outfitting. The home that I bought, um, I went and found a, you know, a, a king size bed, kind of the California king, the big, the big ones. It was all hand, hand built, hand carved out of wood, you know, with very, you know, very fancy with a four poster, four post bed, and uh, it was, it was only six hundred dollars. That that bed, in, at least in Canada, would have probably been ten thousand dollars. So, you know, you can, you can see that. There's not, to me, there's not a lot of reason. Most of the people that I talked to that chose to bring their 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 belongings down, especially furniture and things like that, you know, kind of wish they hadn't because they, you know, had so many options to to do that within in Nicaragua, and you know, there's no sense in bringing North American furniture, for example. You're you're also allowed though to bring um, import a, a vehicle um, every every four years under the residency program. But again, you know, just just as simple to buy a vehicle in, in, in the country of Nicaragua. So full disclaimer here, I live in that building that you're seeing there in the picture at Grand Pacifica. Grand Pacifica is, is one of our properties in Central America. But we have a lot to offer in Grand Pacifica. So I, I think, you know, the point of this isn't to try to sell anybody on all this today. I, I just want to give you an idea of the, the kind of variety that we have in, in the property and whether you choose in the future to, to buy something at Grand Pacifica or not or somewhere else in Nicaragua or you choose another country altogether, you know, certainly feel free to, to contact us. We have a lot of experience in all the different countries and are always happy to, to promote them. We'll go, we'll go through this a little bit faster and, and make sure that we kind of stay on, on track here. Grand Pacifica is a pretty large resort, 2,500 acres. There's almost four miles of beachfront, and it's different kinds of beachfront. There's a reef area for it's um, 
In fact, the, the reef is called Meat Grinders by the surfers. And as you can imagine um, why, it's not very fun to land on, but it's a very challenging expert wave, very popular for, for expert surfers. We also have a, a property or a beach called Asachio, which is, is more of a, you know, a beginner to intermediate wave for surfers. And it's, a, it's sand bottom and, and you know, much easier. That's where I tend to go with a, with a boogie board for a Saturday afternoon. We're, we're, we're the closest beach resort to the airport, the international airport in Managua. And we just recently, you know, this a um, couple months ago, actually finished the, the paving all the way to the resort. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of excitement about that. People are, you know, obviously in the rainy season, if you're not, if you don't have a paved road, it can be challenging. But, but now it's paved right to our, our gate. And um, it's about, you know, it takes me about 40 minutes. I'm a reasonably quick driver, but you know, probably 40, 45 minutes from the Managua to, to Grand Pacifica, which is nice because, you know, my wife and I like to go for dinner in, in the city once in a while or, you know, whatever, to a movie or whatever event. And then, you know, we're only three quarters of an hour from home. So you drive home that evening and, and, and get back to our little secluded life on the beach. So we, we have a, a, a nice uh, golf course currently in nine holes that are completed um, re really pretty one, you know, people that are into, into golfing and, you know, like Pebble Beach course, our, our number four hole is a lot like a, you know, Pebble Beach's signature hole. So it's, it's really pretty. With the, the red star there, you can see is, is the location of Grand Pacifica, pretty much central in the country. Uh, if you see Managua in the, in the dark bold lettering and, and, Messiah below that and Granada below that and then up up left a little bit from there is Leon. So you have all the major cities kind of very close. Grand Pacific is quite central to it. So our, you know our, our current site plan it's always always growing or adding communities. We try to have something for everyone. Um, we have you know kind of in different price ranges, different lifestyles, um, types. You know we have any, everything from um, what, what's called Casita Village with uh, pretty small footprint homes to uh, an eco-friendly community. It's uh, solar powered and gray water reuse homes and that sort of thing to uh, more standard type of homes and then kind of the uh, estate acreages. And so it kind of runs the gamut. We've got a, a lot of different types of neighborhoods and but everybody kind of congregates usually at sunset by the beach at the restaurants and and you know, and really enjoys the evening and, and you know, it's, it's very community oriented. Again, another kind of view of it. There's a lot of things on site and obviously within, you know, close driving range to, to do uh, in the area. You know, a lot of these things are, are actually, very, you know, very interesting. You know, looking down here at the Catarina Market, it's very, very cool looking down on the Laguna. Um, you know, the, the Florida Canyon Rum Factory Tour is, is pretty cool. If you go to Mexico, you do the tequila tours. Well, in, in Nicaragua, you do the, the rum tours. There's, there's just a lot of different things to, to take in. I'll go through the communities fairly quickly because, you know, there's a number of them and, and you know, this is being recorded. So uh, we'll, we'll, you know, you'll have, you'll have the ability to go back and look through this at any time if you want. So our, our first um, phase one community was called is called San Diego Viejo, um, and it, it it's uh, close to the beach. You see the kind of the faded part in that picture at the bottom. That's that's the ocean front. There's 204 home sites. Um, there's already over 80 residences in the community, so it's it's not you know it's not an empty bunch of, of home sites. Uh, lots of you know, nice cobblestone streets and park and parking areas and park areas and uh, you know, nice sidewalks to walk on. We're one of the few communities that took in and thought about a lot of this up front. We had, uh, it was designed by, you know, the same designers that, the community was designed by the same designers that did a number of uh, Disney properties. And, you know, with the, everything from, you know, sidewalks slope down to the, to the road. So it's, you know, um, handicap access and that sort of thing. So there's been a lot of thought put into, into the design of the communities. 
you see the the the, the, the lots start at forty nine thousand. We've actually had quite a, a number of sales of lots in the last few weeks, and partly probably because um, you know the, the road was completed, and and you know there's a lot of interest in in the property, in the resort, and and also I think you know to be honest, it's a bit of of COVID. I think the, the people you know are looking at alternatives to being where they might be right now. So you know, we're seeing a you know kind of a, a surge in, in interest in the properties. So here's an example of a really nice kind of mid-sized house um, under three hundred thousand dollars, two bedroom, two bath. You know, in the bottom left hand corner, that's the, the view from the backyard. It has a nice pool and you see the ocean and the sunsets. It's it's a really nice place. Casita Village is what I mentioned earlier. It's a smaller, smaller homes, you know, smaller footprint. Um, you know, kind of easy to easy to get into from a from a cost perspective, and and still very you know within the resort have all the amenities of the resort at your fingertips. So it's it's also a pretty popular a little community. And uh, the the properties there, the home sites started. 39,000, I think we actually have one right now that's even a little less than that, about $35,000. And uh, actually right on the, on the golf course too. So not too many places that you can buy, you know, golf course frontage property to build your, your home on for in the, you know, the $30,000 range. Santa Barbara is the, the estate community that I was mentioning earlier. It's one, it's one of our most recent um, communities in, in Grand Pacifica. These most of the lots are over an acre, um, many of them beachfront, uh, kind of an exclusive oceanfront home sites in the area. And it, again, it's you know right against the water, so you're you know you're literally watching the, the sunset and the waves from your from your backyard. And these these properties start at uh, $189,000. Las Perlas is the, the, the condominium uh, village that we that I mentioned earlier. The building up in the top left there is is like I said, I, I live with my wife and I live in that in that building in one of the units. And um, you know, we, we really love it. It's right, it's right on the ocean front, and we're um, we're we're just about done in the next few months. Um, the next building in the Las Perlas Oceanfront Village, it's I believe there's one unit left for sale in that in that um, building, and then we're starting on the third building. Um, you'll see here, kind of the artist rendering. So the building on your left is the one that exists there. The uh, this, the lower building and to to the right of the of that is the restaurant and the uh, infinity pool and you know clubhouse there for for meetings and the front desk for rentals and that sort of thing. And then the, the horseshoe. Kind of a buildings is the next is the next ones that we're building currently. So, you know, if you're if you're interested in you know, one of those units, you know, we actually pr can provide up to 50% financing on them, um, and they're, they're they're really nice um, studio units that are that are coming in there. Again, if you look in the top left of this slide, you'll see that kind of that horseshoe and the ocean to your to your left. There's some of the floor plans of the, of the building and um, renderings of the of what the completed rooms will look like. And uh, the one unit that's left, if it's not sold now, it is on sale for 139.9. Again, that's you know for an oceanfront condo, that's a pretty amazing price. And. Uh, Here's a, in the existing building there now, we, we have one for sale as well. Again, for actually under 130,000, it's 129. Um, for this one, it's, again, you're looking at the actual, you know, out, out the actual window onto the deck there. And the ocean is, is right outside your doors. And, and you know, the, these units, and well, in, in full disclosure, I, I mentioned earlier that I had some, some properties here. I, I, I own some of these. Units in the in the Las Perlas building, 
and they, you know, like I said, it's been a rough year in 2018, but surprisingly in 2019, the, the ROI that I received from, from renting my units was the best that I'd ever done. And it equated to uh, roughly 14% um, ROI on, on, on the unit, on what I paid for the units. And I, and I, you know, again, in full disclosure, I sold one of the units recently and, and, you know, basically there, this, you know, there's no promises of how well, the, you know, the prices will do in the future, but I, you know, I, I did, I did quite well. It almost doubled the cost of what I purchased it for. So you know, that, I think the potential for these units is, is, is pretty high. One of our um, subdevelopments and neighborhoods here is the, is the new, newest of them called Playa Pacifica. This is probably, you know, the, the upscale villas that are being developed here by a subdeveloper are pretty amazing. Um, again, un, these, are under, these are two bedroom units, um, can be fully furnished at $345,000. And these are, you know, high end, really, I mean, everything we build is, is high end, but these have been really outfitted very well as well. You know, in addition to that, the, the uh, you know, I know they use the Italian um, cabinetry and, and, and countertops and, and that sort of thing. And, and so, you know, we're, we're really happy to have this, this um, community starting up. And these are, you know, actual pictures from the unit that is, was recently completed and is, is on sale now at, at 345000 plus closing costs. And uh, again, they're, they're oceanfront. They're looking right out into the water. Um, it's just, you know, really, really nice places. And here's the same building on, from the outside, exterior. The one on the right there is a, is a rendering, but the, the left side picture is the, you know, actual building. And, uh, and like I said, they're, they're really, you know, a beautiful set of buildings that are coming up here. There's a floor plan, and again, I, I won't um, dwell on the slides too long because you can go back and look at them in the recording. But they're, you know, they're outfitting them really with high-end equipment, high, you know, security systems, smart TVs, high-end appliances, and and all, you know, everything that you really want if you if you want to live at the, you know, the, on the ocean front with a, a really nice quality unit. Again, I'll, I'll let you read through this in, in the recording, but you know, again, Playa Pacifica is all about the, the high-end quality and it's just steps away from the beach. Um, and our last uh, um, community that I want to talk about very quickly is, is called Eva, or Eva the Eco Village Asachio. These are smart, eco-friendly, tiny homes at Grand Pacifica. And this is actually the first time we've talked about it publicly. So you're, you're hearing it first, but this is plan, planning on coming soon. Um, I'd mentioned Asachio Beach. This is the, the friendly surf wave with the sand bottom, beautiful, beautiful beach. Um, this, this community is, is gonna be built with, with tiny off-grid homes and under, under $99,000 all in. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's another kind of option for people that, you know, want to plan B, but don't want to spend too much money. You get a really nice home that it's also, you know, earth friendly. There's a lot of interesting features with, you know, like, as I said, off grid, it's solar powered. It's going to be loaded with smart technology, you know, gray water recycling that waters your garden. And, uh, these are just some of the renderings of, of kind of what's to come. You know, see the green roof, and and the ni nice thing about it, you know, we, I, I guess, you know, I've become a bit of an expert in sustainable living. I created a, another communities called um, Milagro Verde, which means a green miracle. It's also another one of the communities at Grand Pacifica. But I like to think of myself as eco sensible, not eco crazy. So it, to me, it has to make sense if you're going to build it in. I mean, I think the gray water recycling is, is important. Um, you know, the green roof, I, you know, I don't really think we're making a, a huge difference on the, uh, on the planet's, you know, oxygen production by putting a little pad of grass on top of the roof. But what it does do is it really helps with insulation and efficiency and saves you on air conditioning. Now, the good news of these things, they don't cost you anything from an electric, electricity standpoint because they're, 
you know, they're solar powered, so you're not tapped into any grid. But um, you know, it's still it's it's important to to build these homes efficiently. If you're if you're interested in Nicaragua, I do recommend you, you know, request our Nicaragua handbook from us, and it's free, and it's got a lot of this information, a lot more information, a lot more details on the country itself, and it's just all around a you know a good resource for you. And uh, I apologize that uh, Diego didn't make it onto the to the group because he's like I said, far more interesting to listen to than me. You had to listen to my monotone speech, but hopefully you did get some good information out of this. And um, we'll uh, open it up for, for questions at this point. So one of the first questions is, what would be the cost of a medical plan if I were to live in Nicaragua full time with my wife? Um, this is an interesting question. Let, let me answer that in a, in a kind of roundabout way. Um, I, you can get for, for I'm, I'm in my mid fifties, and I can get a medical full coverage medical plan that allows me to have you know I think it's tests full full toe toe to tip of my head medical testing you know blood testing all sorts of different types of things. Um, and and the the monthly cost is sixty three dollars. I want to say it was in the low sixties um, for for that plan. And of course, that gives you um, a pretty low um, deductible on on any you know serious issues as well. For what I and to be honest, I I, just, <laughs> I didn't even get that even at that price. Um, my experience, I, I I'll tell you my experience fairly quickly. I, I've I've had the unlucky you know, situation of having kidney stones twice in my life, uh, once in each kidney, and once in Nicaragua, and once in Canada. And <clears throat> I gotta admit, if I ever have them again, I'm going to Nicaragua to deal with them because uh, my experience in Nicaragua was, was even much better than my, my experience in Canada. Um, I, I had a late night, it was a late Saturday, and I, uh, I started experiencing kidney stone pains, although I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if my appendix had burst or whatever it was, but it was, it was a little scary for the first time you have kidney stones and it's extremely painful. And um, I was lucky enough to, to, to find somebody that, that, I was in a little fishing village in up Northern Nicaragua, far from anywhere. And um, I found somebody that had a, a friend that was a urologist and he said, I'll just call this guy. And so I did, and he was out at a party. This was 10, 30, 11 at night in Managua. And he said, well, if you want, I, I can run up there because Nicaraguan doctors still do house calls. And I said, no, I'm, I'm going to make it through this. I'll, I'll come and see you in the morning. So he, he had a clinic in Lyon, which was the closest city I was to. So I came there in the morning, and uh, there was literally no wait time. I went right in, got you know the consultation with him, did a bunch of tests, ultrasound and blood work. And everything, and then he brought me into another urologist's office and said, "You you might want a second opinion, so you know, just in case, why don't you talk to him about it?" And you know, we go, we went through everything again, and you know, and and then and then at the end, he prescribed some some medication for me, and he actually walked me across the street to the pharmacy and uh, helped me make sure that you know the pharmacy would would give me the right medication. And when I went back to the to the clinic to to pay him, uh, and I, I asked what it cost, and it was it was sixty five dollars for two consultations, all the blood work, ultrasound, medication, everything included. So at that point, I realized it's pretty hard to spend money on on, on medical things in Nicaragua, and the uh, the Vivian Palace Hospital is a um, it's it's in a group with the Mayo Clinic. Um, it, it's really state of the art. Um, it's, it's an amazing hospital. So sorry I spent a little bit of time on this particular question, but you can get inexpensive uh, um, medical plans. And, and you know, even if you don't, the cost of, of medical is, is so much less. Even as a Canadian, I, I think it's cheap. And, and we have virtually free medical in Canada. But I, the quality of medical, frankly, is better in Nicaragua than it is in, in Canada. At least that was my experience. Um, next question is, do you think U.S. sanctions will influence the government's attitude towards people from U.S.? Um, 
Interesting question, but actually, no, I, I don't. The, um, the, the country and the government isolate the concept of the U.S. government from U.S. people um, and really appreciate Americans and Canadians and Europeans bringing, you know, well need, you know, much needed economic dollars to the country. If you're buying property or you're even just as a tourist spending money in the country, you're very appreciated. And, and that's different than some countries. Some countries you go to, to feel, you feel like nobody wants you there, but Nicaragua is the opposite. The people are very friendly and, and really appreciate, you know, tourists coming and, and expats living there because we generate jobs and, and the government recognizes that as well. And without, without tourism, the economy is a lot, you know, lo, you know, a lot worse off. So I, I've never experienced, I mean, you can't look at me and tell whether I'm U.S. or Canadian, so it, it doesn't really matter. I get treated just like any, anybody else from the States, but it's always been positive. I've never had any, any issues. Um, next question is, is the sand kind of dark on the beach in the development? Are there many rocks? As I mentioned earlier, there, there's actually quite a variety of, of beach environment, even at Grand Pacifica. Keep in mind, you know, the, the country is a volcanic mountain range. So, I, you know, a lot of, the, uh, a lot of the, um, the sand actually gets pretty black when it gets wet. But when it's dry, it's, it's you know, like a light sand color. It's not the white, you know, sand of the, of the Caribbean, but it's still, you know, beautiful kind of powdery, light, light colored sand. But it, it's really interesting in some parts of the country, it, you know, it almost has like a gold flecks in it and you get a lot of reflection from it. it it's, it's quite pretty, which actually amazingly enough keeps it cooler too because it's quite reflective. Um, but there, this part in this picture that you're looking at is, is right in front of the reef um, that surfing reef I was talking about, and so there are there are volcanic ledges. They're you know kind of not really rocks, but oh, it makes it really nice for fishing. If you like fishing, you can cast it off of there, and the fishing is really good. But then if you walk down, you can start seeing like to the left of this picture in the background, um, you know, becomes sandier. And as you go towards Asachio, it's just all sand for miles. You can walk or you know ride a motorcycle or a golf cart or whatever you want for. Or 20 miles of sand. So it's, it's, it's a mix. It's kind of whatever you're looking for. But you know, this reef also offers something really nice. And what it does is you can't see it on this picture, but where the condos are in the background, and if you go a little further to the right, the reef act is a bit of shaped like a horseshoe. So it protects the, uh, protects the beach from, from waves. So you get a really nice kind of swimming pool out in the, in the ocean. And, and then the reef has kind of potholes in it, you know, the worn out, I don't know, I guess sandstone was mixed with the, uh, with the volcanic lava rock. So the fish get trapped in, in those potholes and you, you know, it's really cool at, at low tide, you can go out there and you see these bright blue and yellow, various kinds of tropical fish, you know, literally in little natural aquariums all, all over the beach. So it's, it's an interesting, it's a really interesting beach. Uh, the next question is, can you get Nicaraguan citizenship? Um, is it easy to get? Um, can you buy citizenship like you can in some other, like in the Caribbean countries? Um, the, the residency I mentioned earlier is, is your pathway to, to Nicaraguan citizenship. Once you've had residency for five years, you're allowed to uh, apply for the citizenship. Um, and it, it's to the best of my knowledge, and, and I have to actually check in this, but I, I don't believe that other than filling out forms and a couple meetings that you have to have, it, there's no additional cost to, the, to, to, to getting the citizenship. It's not like some countries will literally, you know, sell you for half a million dollars or some are a lot more expensive than that. They'll sell you a citizenship in them. Um, you know, Panama is a lot less than that, um, but, but Nicaragua has a different kind of path through residency to, to citizenship. Um, what are the build time frame requirements once a lot is purchased? Um, on record, we, you know, we are at, at three years from when you build, we, you know, we're building a community. We don't really, you know, where people do it. We don't really encourage speculation on the, on the home sites where you, you know, you buy it and you, you flip it, but it, you know, certainly it happens. 
you know, people you know, looking to make money, it's, you know, it's doable. But we're trying to build a community. So we, we want people to build homes on their property. And so we, we, we put in a, a time frame. And, you know, we're, we're flexible on that. If, you know, when, for instance, in 2008, when, when the recession hit, uh, you know, we, we gave people extensions, you know, to, to where it was comfortable for them to begin building later. And that could, you know, could go on for months or years, depends on it. But, you know, we're, we're, it, we're not tyrants. We're going to, you know, definitely make sure that, you know, you, you enjoy your property and your, your home. We obviously, we want you to, to become part of the community though. So we encourage people to build, build their homes. Um, next question. Um, address the expat community size and, and language barriers. Well, the, the, the expat community is actually quite, quite large. Obviously at Grand Pacific, it's mostly expats. There's also Nicaraguans. We have, uh, you know, people from South America or people, it's a, it's a really nice mix when you're, you know, I, we get together and dinner and put tables together at the restaurant and everybody sits around and enjoys each other's company. And it's, it's a really nice mix. Um, the rest of the country has several expat communities. Um, Granada, the city I was talking about, has a, has a very large expat American and Canadian expat community. Uh, San Juan del Sur uh, as well, which is a kind of a, a beach and surf community to the, to the south side of the country. And um, well, language barriers is, a, is an e interesting one for me personally. My, my wife is uh, from Ecuador. Um, she speaks Spanish and, and English fluently, fortunately. But, you know, even before I, I met her, um, my Spanish is terrible, and, and, and she reminds me of that daily. But the, I, I get by just fine in Nicaragua. I mean, I, you know, I pick up a number of words here and there, and the longer you spend in the country, the, the more it rubs off on you. But, you know, for whatever reason of, of, of skills that I, I might possess, picking up a new language does not seem to be one of them. So as hard as I, I try, I, I, I struggle. Maybe I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I find the people who just go out and don't care and just try to say the language like they think it sounds, do the best and pick up the most words and become the most integrated. So I'd, I'd encourage anybody to just not be timid about it. Just, you know, and, and you know, like, I remember I had a strange story, but I had an experience in, in France where you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't speak French and it, it was, you know, it was a detriment to getting around and, no, you know, nobody wanted to, even if they could speak English, they didn't want to try, which was my experience. But in Nicaragua, you know, the local people are, are again, friendly and, you know, always, you know, trying, you know, you can get by with a lot of hand signals, even if you don't speak the language and they're going to always work with you and, you know, and they also want to learn English to improve their lives. And so it, it's it's really not been a barrier. Um, I guess it, it's only a barrier if you if you make it one. But I, I go out. I you know go out in villages by myself and you know whatever. I got to pick up some some you know a door or something. And, so, and I you know I have no problems getting my point across or understanding people. It's it's a lot of like I said a lot of hand signals are kind of universal language. Are there different clubs um, sailing? golf, tennis. Uh, we, well, we at Grand Pacifica here, I guess we didn't really have many pictures of the golf course. It's a beautiful golf course here at, on the property. There are, a new, there are numerous golf courses. There's um, Nahapa is another one in, in Managua. There's a couple other resorts that have uh, golf courses as well. Um, that are all, are, there's, most of them are public. And um, we're just in the process actually of finishing up our tennis courts on the property. Um, and sailing, I, I'm an avid sailor actually. Um, the, the ocean here is pretty rough. We don't have a marina built yet at Grand Pacifica, but there, there are places to, to keep your boat. Um, there's, a, there's a marina not too far to the north of us, and then there's one in San Juan del Sur to the south of us. And uh, actually one of, our, one of our residents does have a small sailboat, but he, uh, you know, he brings it out on a, on a trailer and, and and uh, launches it that way. But, you know, there's certainly jet skis and things like that around. But, but yeah, there's, there's different kinds of clubs and, and that sort of thing. And, and you know, Managua has, uh, has the, the golf club as well. 
So there, there, there's different types of things, certainly, to, to join and be part of. You know, and, you, you know, you, you'll meet a lot of people, too, and, and with varying interests, so that you really n never find that sort of thing that you'd be lacking in it. Uh, next question. Uh, what is the internet access like? What about electricity reliability? Um, I'll start with that one here first. There's a few other questions, but um, we, we have, uh, again, Nicaragua um, has, has good internet access generally. Um, we at Grand Pacifica have, have, have whatever, I mean, you can basically order whatever speed of internet you, you want. I mean, almost, you know, a, a good portion of the people living down there typically, you know, if they're, if they're not retired, they're working from home and they're, we have, you know, we have stock traders and we have all sorts of different types of um, people that are, are working from home that re rely on the internet. And, and it's, you know, it's not perfect. There's sometimes when it goes down, but in general, it's, it's, it's very reliable. We actually use um, streaming television so you can have all the, you know, almost any television station you want in the, in the world. And that's all coming through the internet as well. And electricity reliability, it's, 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 always improving, you know, in the, I'd say 10 years ago, it was pretty annoying. Um, recently, it's, it's good. Some people do, you know, have generators. Uh, obviously, the eco villages, you know, have uh, solar power, they don't really care how reliable it is. But um, they just recently put in a new uh, electrical station, um, just up the highway from the entrance into into Grand Pacifica. And that's really increased the, the reliability of a lot. The, the country has put, uh, I would say, more than probably any other Central American country in recent years, has put a lot of money into infrastructure, roads, electricity, water systems, um, and that sort of thing. So um, it's really become pretty good. In fact, we get a lot of good comments from renters saying, oh, I was surprised I was able to stream video and everything like that with the, with the internet and, and electricity had, had no issues. Um, how far is the nearest medical facility doctor? Well, we have doctors actually living on the property. Um, what about ambulance service? Uh, mo most people living on the property use the, the Vivian Pellis Hospital that I was talking about, the kind of world-class hospital in Managua. So that's about, I mean, it's about an hour away. They have ambulance service, but you know, typically you know, if, if somebody needs you know, something, then we, somebody in the community typically brings them there been fortunate enough not to not to require that often but there is actually a you know in, a, in an extreme emergency there's a helicopter service too and we have a spot for helicopter to land right on the property uh, what is the timeline for the Ava tiny homes to be completed um, well it's been delayed a little bit because of the whole COVID thing so we're hoping to to launch the construction at uh, basically in, uh, you know, probably just after Christmas, kind of the Q1, and um, by Q3 of 2021, we expect a significant number of homes to be completed. I had that question a few times, actually. So. Are the condos in Ava pet friendly? Yes. Uh, I mean, there is, I guess the exception to that is if uh, a particular owner rents out their condo and they don't want pets in it, they have the right to, to request it of the property management company. But in general, the, the you know, the, everything is, everything's pet friendly. We, you know, we have some rules in the, in the resort that, you know, you're outside of your own home, that pets needs to be on a leash and that sort of thing, but you know, kind of typical resort residents you know, regulations. If you buy a lot in Santa Barbara, for example, who designs and builds the home? Well, we, that's optional. I mean, we, we have a, you know, in full disclosure, we have a Grand Pacific construction division that does design and build homes. But if you have, you know, a preferred architect or you're an architect yourself and or a construction person, then, you know, you're, you're not, you know, you're not stopped from, from doing that yourself. Um, you know, we ask if you do bring in um, a construction company that they're, they're we, we, we kind of vet them and, and authorize 
that they're used because we don't want anybody to have a, a bad experience. I mean, we don't want you coming to a new country for your for yourself and and you know something goes wrong with your construction. So we, you know, we try to, you know, we we try to coach you, I guess, as best as possible. But that doesn't mean you certainly have to use the the Grand Pacific Construction Division. There's five or six um, currently authorized construction companies and architects in the property and, and people use various ones for various homes. Um, if you own a property and you want to sell it later, are there licensed agents to list the property? Yeah, we actually have um, uh, resale agents that even live right on, on the resort. And um, yeah, they're obviously happy to list your property for you if that's what you choose to do. As the government crackdown of 2018 eased off, um, what restrictions did you experience yourself during the time? Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 eventually the, the government, you know, opened up the roads because protesters had closed the roads and there was, you know, standoffs and things like that. And there, so there was a bit of a crackdown in terms of, you know, freeing up transportation flow and things like that. That was back in, I guess, May-ish, May or June of 2018. So that's, I guess, more than two years ago now. Um, in terms of what restrictions did I experience for myself, you know, very little. People were very civilized about it. You know, we, I had to go to the airport and back and even pick up, you know, friends and things like that during that time. And, you know, I ran into protesters blocking roads, but they would typically make us sit there for 10 minutes or whatever and then wave us through. And, you know, there was, there was no... You know, sometimes I would take shortcuts and get lost at different parts of Managua because I was trying to get around the roadblocks. But, you know, it, it for me, it, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't a scary situation. But, you know, obviously, like I said, I don't want to play it down like it wasn't a serious situation. But, and are, are people, one of part of the question, are people um, still feeling threatened? And No, I mean, life has returned basically to normal and, you know, it, it uh, it, you know, it's unfortunate that that situation occurred because it really had a, you know, a big impact on on tourism and, and it's, you know, it takes a decade to build up the tourism and in one nasty event to to ruin it for weeks and months, years again. So, you know, but we've, we're seeing it start to come back certainly this year. And it's, un, again, unfortunate that the, the COVID hit situation hit. Of course, that's unfortunate for everybody in the world. But when you get a kind of a one-two punch like that for the country, it's it's not been it's not been easy for it. But you know, like I said, the people of Nicaragua are optimistic. They're friendly, and uh, you know, when they when you're used to not having employment for you know a lot of your life, you know, and you live in a tropical climate where you can walk to the beach and and fish for dinner and go pick you know fruit off the trees and grow vegetables and all that sort of thing, you, you know, you're, they're not worried about sustaining life. Um, that makes a big difference because now you're not, you know, you're not desperate and you're, you're not, you know, turning to crime, for instance, to, to put food on the table for your family. So we haven't seen, you know, the, uh, you know a crime rate really change. Uh, we've, you know, at least not from my perspective, I don't know what the, you know, the most recent um, stats will be, but it certainly doesn't feel like there's been a, a change. You know, so hopefully, you know, with the with the, the the COVID situation, the virus situation, that things will ease off and improve all over the world, and uh, obviously that'll be good for Nicaragua as well. So I think that's all the questions we have. I think I went over time probably a lot, but um, I certainly appreciate everybody that hung through the call. And and like I said, I not the most entertaining guy to listen to, and I'm sorry we missed. Diego on the call, but we'll get him on next time. And uh, thanks everybody for, for attending. It's been great talking to you about Nicaragua and I'm always open to ask you know private questions later on if you wanna send emails or whatever that I'd be happy to respond to them. So thanks very much and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye.